And here we go. Welcome back, everybody, to the podcast. We are joined once again by Dr. Kat, Gavin Kerr. And uh, hey, happy, happy, hey. Holy, holy, happy Holy Week, by the way. Happy <laughs> Holy Week. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you. Good to be yeah. back. How you doing? Good. Well, a uh, little bit tired today. It's been a very busy uh, morning, you know, beautiful mass. But then we had a, a birthday party, uh, as I was telling you about. And uh, yeah, boy, just a lot of energy there. But I'm, I'm, I'm doing doing well. Uh, we're yeah, going to talk yeah. about letter to a priest, have a critical discussion of this, uh, yeah, this influential uh, little volume here. We'll introduce people to what this is about, and um, and then we'll launch mm. into a wider discussion around that. Uh, I yeah, think a lot of people yeah. are kind of anticipating what that might involve. But before we do that, uh, Gavin, how are you? What have you been up to and anything you want to announce or any new projects you've been working on? Um, oh, well, a ton of projects that I'm working on. Um I just I just found out there on Thursday that the off prints of an article um, which is being published uh, have just arrived and it's an article on the third way. So I've got an article on the third way now has appeared in print. So I'm getting the off prints. Um, it's a colleague of mine at our sister institution, Maynooth University. He is the editor of the journal. So I need to call up and see him and get the off prints. So um, that's something coming out. I've got an article coming out on faith in Nova Vetera, and I actually just got the galley proofs for my article in the first way awesome. in, in Nova Vetera. Um, you and I are, you know, racing to get this five ways book just, you know, completed, signed off uh, because it's due any day now, and it's uh, more or less finished. We're just teasing out the final chapter, aren't we? Yep, something uh, like that. <laughs> we'll get it in. We'll get it in when we get it in, right? <laughs> um. Other than that, you know, I'm just, you know, doing all the same old stuff. We've got the big conference coming up um, in a few weeks at uh, Maynooth and uh, really looking forward to that. Really excited. Going to see some great people and I actually have to write my paper for it. Um, so I'm um, get, getting on with that. And uh, at the minute, um, I'm teaching philosophy of nature, medieval philosophy, logic um, at, at the college and, you know, doing all sorts of postgrad work. And uh, as well, I'm doing my weekly radio show on Radio Maria on Faith and Reason. Sure. It's good fun. And then, uh, and this is my birthday weekend, so I've been partying all weekend. Happy <laughs> early birthday! It's on Tuesday, right? So two days. Tuesday. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So I'll be thirty-nine. I don't know if I look thirty-nine, but I, I, I think I think that still counts as a young scholar. So uh, am I still a young scholar? Right. Okay. Maybe thirty-five so, yeah. is a cut off. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's that, and um, oh, yeah, it's just been an awesome weekend. You know, did a lot of training. Um, was at a kung fu on Friday. A lot of training yesterday because I'm running in the Belfast Marathon as part of the relay yep. team. And, you know, absolutely annihilated myself this morning. Myself and my wife did a, you know, a session this morning. Absolutely annihilated ourselves with the battle ropes and all the rest. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, love the battle ropes. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a pint of coffee next to me just to get me through this session. Good. Yeah, I could use some coffee. So maybe at some point I'll have my wife bring me down a cup. Uh, but let's... Um, Let's get into it, Gavin. So get, set, set some, uh, do some stage setting for us. <laughs> Introduce us to the text we're going to be going uh, through. Give us some historical background. And then maybe we should discuss why we wanted to discuss this as well. What's why we think this is relevant for the channel. And mm. then we'll just, we'll just take it from there. Mm -hmm. So this letter to a priest that Simone Veal wrote, she was in touch with a number of priests about, you know, sort of, discussing maybe the prospect of entering the church or at least just um, her feelings towards Catholicism, her sometimes, you know, very um, ambivalent and ambiguous uh, feelings towards Catholicism. So, I mean, she did what anybody would do and, you know, be in contact with, you know, various priests. And the priest that she is in contact with with this letter is a priest that um, Jacques Maritain um, suggested that she get in contact with. And, and a Dominican is always a good person. Uh, to get in contact with if one is intellectual and wants to um, uh, think about entering the church or, you know, en engaging um, with um, the, the faith life of the church. So the Dominican is always, you know, good if one is an intellectual and one wants to do that. Mm -hmm. um, she writes this letter to the to this priest, Father Edward Couturier. Um, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that. My French is terrible. I can only read it. I can't speak it. Um but she writes to him, and he's in the States, and she wrote this just before she left the States to go back to London because she was working as part of the, the, the French resistance, you know, and, you know, the, um, the, the, the French government, the De Gaulle government, you know, in exile. She's kind of, you know, working hand in hand with these people. <coughs> and she writes this letter 
and it's a it's a pretty lengthy letter. Um, it's thirty something sort of sentences, and that's that's the in the edition that I have. Um, it goes up to thirty. 35 sections in it. The, it looks like we, yeah, we have the uh, we have the same edition here, it looks like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Rulich edition. Uh, and she makes a number of assertions um, about the, the well, well, the nature of Christianity, the claims that Christians make, the claims that the church makes. And her leading question is, um, can one be a Catholic if one holds what she asserts in these various chapters? And obviously what she asserts in these various chapters is uh, very much contrary uh, to what the church teaches. And, you know, reading through this letter to a priest, I mean, God, I wouldn't have wanted to be have been that priest that she wrote this letter to, because I would have read it and just thought, no, no, <laughs> if you believe half of this stuff that you say, you know, no, this is this is a direct contradiction. That's to, right. To, the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed, mm-hmm. which is, you know, the benchmark of kind of what, you know, we believe as Catholics and we recite every Sunday at Mass. Um, so, yeah, it's very much at odds um, with Catholicism. Uh, but this maybe brings around the sort of uh, my personal um, sort of engagement with this. I have a lot of colleagues, professional colleagues, um, who really enjoy Simone Veal and Simone Veal's work. Um, and I, I've also had people um, just online and various platforms talk about Simone Veal's work and actually ask me about this Latter Day Priest, about what I thought about it. So <clears throat> I just thought, um, you know, I should really maybe just engage with this at some point. There, the, there are Catholics, uh, Catholic philosophers, Catholic thinkers whose opinions I, um, you know, would value uh, and that I wouldn't diverge from too much. Uh, but <clears throat> Uh, so I, I felt that maybe I should engage with this lady uh, and her thinking. And the letter to the priest always comes up. It's, you know, maybe something that I should engage with. This isn't the only thing I'm engaged with. I'm engaged with other uh, of her work, um, particularly um, her whole notion of the need for roots. Um, but um, this letter to the priest really stood out. It was a nice, short one. I could just get, you know, sort of into the mind of this thinker in some sort of way, see where she's coming from. And when I read it, I was shocked and stunned. <laughs> I was shocked and stunned. I mean, I just, uh, I couldn't understand just what was so appealing about um, her thinking. Now, granted, her thinking in this, she, she's struggling to come to terms with um, her faith and what she believes, and fair enough. Uh, and the other, some, some of the other stuff that I've read has been all right, you know, by Simone Veil. It, it's been all right. Um, it hasn't been great, and you can find better representatives of some, especially on the on the person and the output elsewhere. Um, but this letter to a priest, I, I just stumbled by it, and I found it odd that um, you know, really sort of solid Catholic thinkers um, could recommend this sort of thinking. I, I would imagine anybody maybe unsure about Catholicism reading the letter to a priest would be left even more unsure if not, you know, right. turned in the other direction. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and there were a number of issues in it, in, in the letter to a priest, which I see not within contemporary academic or intellectual culture, but I see emerging within the contemporary culture just at large. And so I think, um, because I don't think it's fair to really sort of go for, you know, a thinker who isn't here to defend herself, especially not in a private letter that she wrote to a priest. If I'm going to go for Simone Veal, really go for, I would go for her in her published work. Um, but I think it's a good sort of entryway into how we can challenge the contemporary culture and the contemporary culture's ambivalence uh, and misunderstanding uh, towards Catholicism, um, and, and particularly for us as Catholics, for, you know, Catholics who are intellectually, historically, and academically rooted. How we can engage with a culture that, um, uh, rather than you know even dealing with the precise details of faith, just refuses to ask the question uh, of right. faith. So it's a good entryway into that. So that's so that's kind of a bit of a context and a bit of you know sort of where I'm coming from on this whole issue. Yeah. So I'll give a little bit of my background. Um, <clears throat> this this work particularly came uh, into my consciousness when I was really interested in Maritan and the wider um, context of, of Jacques Maritain. And as you said, there was, there's some relatedness here, but also because other people that uh, I have talked to uh, who were kind of, um, kind of like Veil vale herself. I mean, she was somebody who was really drawn to the church in a certain sense, but then this is essentially 
um, her wondering if these beliefs are compatible with, or maybe they're seen as objections to. So she never really, she was drawn to it in a sense, but then never was really able to obviously fully come, come to it. And I've talked to a number of other people who, yeah, essentially uh, held similar sentiments and whether uh, they connected with the letter to a priest because they already held those sentiments or because they read this letter and then developed those sentiments, which is kind of to your point, Gavin, like if you give this to somebody who's already on the fence, like, I agree. I don't mm -hmm. think this is, I don't think this is sending them in. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so like, okay, this, this sounds like something I should, should really read and, and spend time with. And uh, yeah, I, I'll be honest. The first time I picked it up, like you, I was uh, extremely, um, I was extremely unimpressed to say probably the most charitable thing about it now. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, and, and part of that might just be, I had the, the wrong expectations. Uh, maybe I was expecting a sort of very dense systematic, like philosophical, like, like yes. <laughs> dissection yeah, yeah, yeah. and attack mm -hmm. of the Catholic church. And really what you get in a lot of this is a lot of just flagrant um, assertion. A lot of it just, just wrong assertion. That's not supported with, with argument or proper citation, a lot of mm -hmm. complaints uh, a lot of biases. Um, so I found almost none of it to be exceptionally interesting. A lot of it to be really disappointing. And mm. uh, I just haven't ever picked it up since until mm. you mentioned we should do an episode on it. I'm like, all right, well, then I'll, <laughs> I'll pick it up again finally after all this. So look, guys, the, the cards are on the table. You know where Gavin and I are coming uh, on from this, uh, coming from on this. Um, mm. I I have never read anything else um, from Simone uh, Vale. Uh, so maybe mm. some of the other stuff is is a lot better than this but my impression of this is very low um and so that's yeah so that's what you're going to get in this episode you're going to get a pretty critical review i don't know gavin do you want to start with any, any nice words about it maybe <laughs> diving into some of the details yeah i think what one of the um sort of refrains that i keep hearing an awful lot from my catholic you know academic friends who really appreciate veal is that she is a genuine searcher um after truth uh and the letter to a priest represents part of that existential struggle um now I, i've read other works of hers and you know i'm very interested in her idea of the need for roots uh, uh, and i'm also interested in her view of, of the self because um whilst she seems to want to avoid a you know post cartesian substantial self i think she goes uh, you know way too far in the other direction you know, of envisaging the self as, you know, being, you know, entirely nothing to do with, you know, you know, me, the, the, the actual individual who is the self and everything to do with what gives the self its selfhood with the, with that source of selfhood and, and that, and that, and that roots that discussion, you know, into that historical platonic tradition that what is the reality of the participant vis-a-vis uh, -vis its relation to the participated perfection. If you have a participated perfection, you know, form or whatever, um, it gives its reality to the participant. But sometimes that can be overemphasized to such an extent that the participant no longer has its own, you know, reality. Granted, a participated reality, but its own reality nonetheless. And Veil's views on the self, so far as um, I've understood them, seem to go along that, that line, that the self and that everything that is good in the self is pure gift, completely borrowed, um, has to be, it's on loan. There is nothing um, which, you know, represents, you know, a genuine actuality um, of the self, albeit a secondary participated, limited actuality, but a genuine actuality nonetheless. Everything seems to be swallowed up um, within the, the, the perfection of the gift giver um, for the self and, you know, that, that even goes beyond Platonism. I mean, that emerges as a problem in Platonism, which I, I think only Aristotle really sort of, you know, uh, puts to rest. But that goes even beyond Platonism towards a kind of, you know, all-encompassing Parmenideism, you know, that, you know, this, this source of goodness and perfection, which grants all that is good and, you know, all that is actual to the self is actually, you know, really just the only one true self, the only one true actuality, and everything else is just a big shadow or imitation of it and doesn't have any reality of its own, mm -hmm. which um, I think is not only bad philosophy, but uh, inconsistent with the, the kind of, you know, Christian sort of, you know, vision of things that, you know, we're going to be looking at. But that's a bit of a, you know, sort of going on a bit of a tangent. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. there, there is some interesting stuff there, but it's interesting stuff that maybe pushes too far um, in a direction that I don't think should be pushed um, thus far, it needs to be tempered um, a wee bit. So, 
that's my other engagement um, with Theo. And I really like the way you say that you wanted reasoned, engaged, systematic argumentation. If one isn't going to be Catholic, well, show me what the problem is here. Show me where there isn't sufficient demonstration, argumentation in favor of Catholicism, or show me where there's a direct contradiction. None of that emerges in a letter to a priest, which is disappointing. Um, so it's more of an existentialist sort of meandering um, that's going on here. And kind of, you know, the way I, I've sort of, you know, approached this, especially for our chat this evening, is to tease out three different issues which kind of emerge throughout the letter to a priest, but which I think... Um, <clears throat> account for a lot of Veal's issues that she has in um, approaching Catholicism or not approaching Catholicism um, as historically the case has turned out to be. Yeah. Now I want to be, I want to be fair. Um, when I came to this text, the reason I, I came to this text is because it was uh, other people that um, I admired their thought were recommending it like, like you, Gavin. Um yeah. So my expectation was set by those other people. So that's why I was saying I was expecting something, you know, quite, quite rigorous and like, oh, man, this must be a real heavy attack on Catholicism. And like, look, yeah, I love yeah. engaging with criticism. I, I think it's really important. Sure, so yeah. that that might not be Vale's fault at all. Right. Because that might have mm -hmm. not been her intent. I'm just saying that was how my expectation was set from those um, that inspire me to go pick it up. And then going in with that expectation, I was obviously quite disappointed for the reasons that you talked about. So I just want to put that qualification there because that might not have been the original author's intent at all to provide something like that. It could just be just, yeah, this existential sort of outlet, right? Yeah. <laughs> but still, nevertheless, it, it's, it's deeply influential, so it's worth engaging, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, I mean, whenever what we have to appreciate in an author is not so much their work, but the fact that they were such an engaging sort of thinker. It yeah. makes me suspicious yeah. of why we should be appreciating them at all. I, I can appreciate Socrates, even though Socrates never re wrote anything. But I appreciate Socrates because, well, it's the Platonic Socrates that I appreciate. It's the Socrates who makes an argument, who takes a position and presents a philosophy. I don't appreciate Socrates as a philosopher um because he lived a heroic life I, I appreciate him as a man for living a heroic life and i can appreciate simone veal um for all her existential sort of engagement wanderings um and just not appreciate um her thinking um and thus far when, when it comes to her thinking i kind of haven't really found an awful lot <laughs> that i can appreciate there but you know reading her biography yeah, I mean, there's there's quite a bit that one could appreciate uh, there. Um, you know, her authenticity, her genuineness, her concern for the needs of others. Um, all of that I can appreciate without having to appreciate um, the, the the thinking and the philosophy in, in her written work. Yes, no, great distinctions, important distinctions, lest anybody misinterpret uh, what we're trying to evaluate and critique here. So mm -hmm. we're looking just at, at the ideas in the letter itself. So Gavin, you had a little outline you wanted to take us through for how you wanted to proceed. So let's uh, let's do it, my friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think what I want to, what I want to begin with is uh, Veal's um, attitude towards the resurrection and the incarnation of Christ. I want to begin with that because that seems to permeate the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. It's a failure to engage with the question of whether or not Christ's resurrection uh, and incarnation were historical events that were asked to affirm. Um, so I want to engage with that first because that seems to permeate the whole thing. Uh, and then I want to move on to uh, Veil's conception of God as the good, not as an agent, but as the good itself. Uh, and then finally, I want to address some of the issues that she um uh, it brings up with regard to uh, truth claims, especially with regard to the dogmas of the faith and whether or not they make truth claims and thus can lay claim um, upon our intellectual assent. And, and just because, just so that, you know, we aren't doing what we accuse Veal of doing, I, you know, a lot of hand wave and assertion and stuff, for each of these, I am going to root it in the text. Um, people may not have the actual text that we're using, so I'm not going to use page number, I'm going to use chapter numbers. So if they're using a different text, they can go to that chapter number and they can read um, exact, exactly what you wrote. So you can pin it down and say, well, look, said this here, here and here. Here's a problem with that. You can't get around that. This is an issue. 
Okay, so okay, yeah, no, we, we as always want to be thorough and fair. So just because I'm telling you I didn't like this thing, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't read it. And if you're engaged in this conversation and you want to make sure that we are handling the text fairly, I would recommend that you do read it, and that will get you all the more I think out of this. So yes, very good, Gavin. Yeah, uh, let, let us begin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the resurrection and the incarnation. So we as Catholics, we affirm um, uh, Christ's historical resurrection. Okay, so that, that that's something that we affirm. We affirm that as a historical event. We're going to celebrate that next week as a historical event. Um, Christ's resurrection is what sort of leads us backwards then to reevaluate all of Christ's ministry. Mm -hmm. Everything is understood in the in the light of Christ's resurrection. That's his triumph. We understand his whole life and death in terms of that resurrection event that occurred, because this was unforeseen. <laughs> Nobody expected this. Um, when he talks to the disciples about rising from the dead, they're like, you know, well, well, what does this mean? Um, you know, you read N.T. Wright's book, The Resurrection of the Son of God. The whole idea of life after death, as N.T. Wright says, is a non-starter um, for Israel. They didn't believe in a life after death. Is There it is. That's the one. Yeah phenomenal book yeah mm -hmm. it's what 900 pages isn't it yes it, yeah that's about right yep mm -hmm. i think you're, you're about 500 pages in before you even start looking at any new testament mm -hmm. sources in that book um yeah so i mean he really does a good job of showing that you know ancient israel didn't believe in this life after death as, as he always points out it was a life after um a period after death um whereas this notion of life after death you know that that was more of a greek notion that that, that comes up in plato this idea of an immortal soul that that's platonic. um so you know christ's disciples didn't really understand what all this talk about rising from the dead would mean so so the resurrection was a complete shock complete shock to them so that leads one back to kind of reevaluating what's going on in christ's life you know who christ is you know who, who this person is and so that leads you know sort of one to think, well, you know, we've got the Son of God, the incarnation of the Son of God. So resurrection and incarnation uh, go hand in hand. If we can affirm that historically the Son of God entered the world, stepped two feet in the dusty earth, that whatever Christ does in the Gospels, that is a divine person doing that. And the resurrection, which, you know, we can affirm as a historical event, we go through all the arguments, right, goes through all the arguments and the reasons why, you know, a good historian can affirm uh, that the resurrection occurred, well, we're sold in. We can affirm that as a truth of our faith. Well, we can affirm that as a truth. And then our faith, St. Paul, 1 Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians 15, our faith is in the promise of our future resurrection, that um, we, we will be able to enjoy the resurrection that Christ currently enjoys in his glorified body. So <clears throat> agree or disagree, with those claims, you agree with them, you know, you're, you're thoroughly within the Christian fold. You, you disagree with them, you're not a Christian. But it is a claim which is being made here that these historical events occurred, do you believe them, right? And, and, and that's what we do, right? The problem with Veal is that she doesn't take that seriously. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's well, like it's not it's not like not even it's not only not that it's not the primary consideration, right? It's just yeah. like not even a consideration, right? <laughs> it's not an issue, and and this kind of you know it, this is why I started with this because throughout the whole thing, uh, and this is just one example throughout the whole thing, the idea that truth claims are being made to be evaluated and affirmed is just dismissed, uh, and I want to focus on this one because this is the central claim of Christianity, but there are other truth claims. Veal said, you know, raises as well, um, which he just dismisses as making any sort of, you know, claim on the intellect. And we are going to get the, the dogmas in, in the final section. Uh, and bearing in mind, this isn't just getting at Veal, because I think this attitude is predominant just within the contemporary culture at large. Um, contemporary culture doesn't seem to take seriously the idea. The truth claims are being made and we're being asked, do we believe these you know, um, you know, when we renew our baptismal promises, we're asked, do we believe this? When we say the creative mass, we're saying this is what we believe. If we don't believe it, what are we doing there? Why are we there? So um, I just it, want to well, let me just pause right there and like, let me emphasize this, because I know there's many people who, who watch this channel that are not Christian or not Catholic. And obviously we haven't laid out N.T. Wright's case or the historical arguments there. I've had many people on this podcast. We've been through that before. Mm. What what we're emphasizing is like you can't kind of ignore this, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and as somebody yeah. who converted, that was actually pretty clear to me, right? It was clear to me yeah. like there are some major radical claims being here that are absolutely central. 
And if there's a <laughs> rational basis to these, then Christianity is like really, really interesting. If it's <laughs> if there's if if there's just no if those claims aren't being made or there's no basis to it whatsoever, then then like you said, like what why would I even really bother yeah. for the most? Or maybe yeah. I can glean some some insights here and there. Um, but yeah. in that sense, I mean, this is where like C.S. Lewis is 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 really good on kind of like a, a basic level with his um, you know, like Christ didn't leave you another option than to evaluate this as Lewis would say, because he didn't intend to, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like you have to like really put the blinders on to not mm. see like there's major claims being made here. And whether you <laughs> believe them or not, it's clear that they're, they're being made. And these yeah. are sort of, they're central, right? They present themselves to us in a way that it just really shocks me when anybody <laughs> is just able to like, think that that's either secondary or just not to be evaluated at all. I can't, I can't wrap my head around that mindset. Because it just even mm. again as somebody who came into there, it just seems so obvious to me that these claims are so radical that like if I'm going to put my attention anywhere, it has to be like here first. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if one's going to choose to enter into a religion, like if one's going to be a convert, you know, like you point out your own case. Now, I, I was never a convert. I'm a cradle Catholic. Um, but if one, but even for me, at one point in my life, I have to ask, well, do I believe this? Yes, I do. So let's just get on with it. And, you know, one point for you, you're like, well, I'm being asked, do I believe this? Do I believe this? And you come to the decision, because I do believe this. So I'm going to get on with the job of being Catholic. And it's it's not setting aside that question, you mean, uh, of, of just, well, whether I believe this or not doesn't matter. You know, what spiritual illumination am I going to get from Catholicism that I don't get from elsewhere? That's not the issue. You know, if Catholicism is true, if it's making tr truth claims, which upon evaluation, you know, you can find that, yes, there are good reasons to believe this, thus I'm going to be a Catholic, the spiritual illumination will follow. Because how are you going to be spiritually illuminated in a religion which is false? You're, you're not. Spiritual illumination is going to be found where the truth is found. And so if one finds that one can affirm the truth that Catholicism is making, the spiritual illumination will follow. So the, the, the judgment of which, you know, religion can't be on the basis of what's going to illuminate me more or what's going to, you know, kind of affirm these sorts of intuitions I have about the spiritual life. Poetry can do that. Going up a mountain can do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the demands, uh, not, not so much the demands, but the invitation, the challenge, which is being made by Catholicism, it, it, it's much more sort of it's much more existential than that actually it's not just about being spiritually illuminated it's about us be, being asked whether or not the vision of reality that catholicism presents is the right one yes right so, i, I want to say one more one more thing I, I tried to articulate this the other night on catholic answers live i was entertaining uh which i always enjoy because i get to talk with people who are skeptics and stuff like that mm. and somebody was asking kind of how do you go it's a good question you know how do you go from the god of the philosopher to the god of the bible which was something i had to do myself right because i i, I really mm. did kind of get to the god of the philosopher first before i um really started taking seriously the claims being made by christianity and catholic church and there is the there is the historical apologetic. Certainly, I think it's very important. So yeah. uh, I cannot recommend N.T. Wright's uh, work enough. Uh, many other great thinkers out there, but I also think like a good philosophy of God and a good philosophy of nature and a good philosophical anthropology helps with prediction that mm. raises raises rational expectation. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that you you do your metaphysics and you get to a conception of God where God is the subsistent good itself, right? And you also have these principles about goodness, that the goodness is sort of, it, it, you know, it has an inclination to communicate itself, to seek union um, well, with its beloved. And, and I think these other very plausible principles that can be extracted through, yeah, just, just good philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. then, then you just kind of like open your eyes and read the newspaper and realize like something's gone wrong with humanity. Like there really has, like something is wrong with us right that there there mm. has been something like a a fall right mm. well then it just kind of makes sense with good philosophy of god and just common experience that we might expect something like an incarnation or <laughs> an atonement right like that's yeah. just yeah. it's just like there's a rash i think with good philosophy there should be a rational expectation for something like this it doesn't mean we need specific predictions i think that's too much but a rational expectation that something like this actually sort of fits really well, I would argue, with a proper and good philosophical paradigm. Then if it's the case that there's something on the historical scene that kind mm -hmm. of matches onto that, 
then it's like, like pay attention to this. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I think, yeah. I think that's that, that philosophical backdrop um, often gets overlooked significantly. Like sometimes um, I think, look, the historical apologetic, I think is really important, but for me, I didn't need that much historical apologetic because a lot of the work was done by the philosophical backdrop. I still needed the historical details. I needed to see that there was a good historical case to be made, but I didn't need the entire case to be made by like entirely just through a study of history, if that makes sense, right? Because sure. there was yeah, a yeah. prediction and it seemed like the prediction was fruitful. And then that provided me, I think, really strong rational warrant for saying, yeah, this is this is sort of the one, right? Um, and then, of course, you can go deeper into the into the into the historical weeds. But I don't know, Gavin, if you have any sort of thoughts on that of how um, good philosophy might be able to help set you up for or make a, a again. I don't think you need specific predictions, but I think there's something about the nature of Christianity that fits so well. I think with good philosophy of God um, that I have never found anything else like that and believe me i looked because before i looked at christianity i was really as as you know i think a lot of spiritual seekers are, i was really interested in eastern religions right um hinduism taoism buddhism and stuff like that so anyway sorry for i'm rambling at this point but yeah well i mean just to kind of cap that off i mean i think that um the point that you make is a good one and i would make it just a more general point that just good philosophy makes you assess truth claims and if a religion is making truth claims then the choice of a religion is not on the basis of how it makes me feel spiritually or whether or not I can get any illumination from it or any, you know, sort of wholesome thoughts or anything like that. You know, good philosophy makes us make us makes us focus on the truth claims and pass over so those feelings of being illuminated and all the rest to, you know, focus our attention on truth claims. And that being the case, Christianity is making truth claims about historical events which we need to evaluate. So the mind of the philosopher is predisposed to addressing those truth claims. Maybe we should read, you know, a passage from Simone Beale, which kind of, you know, articulates the opposing view to ours. So we're, we're kind of getting a feel and saying that this is, um, you know, runs throughout her letter to the priest. So may, maybe there's a, there's a yeah. paragraph here that I think is, is good to read because it just sort of captures her view about the resurrection, would that be all right? Yeah, please read it. Yeah, what, what page are we on for the gentle readers? So, and so for, the gen for the gentle listeners, this is um, chapter 25, and in our edition is pages 34 and 35. There's two particular two particular passages there, and so, I mean, it's, I mean, it's not going to be a reading group, but there's two particular passages, one at the bottom of page 34, and one about halfway down, or about a third of the way down, page 35. And at the bottom of page 34, um, Veal says, Hitler could die and return to life again 50 times, but I should still not look upon him as the son of God. And if the gospel omitted all mention of Christ's resurrection, faith would be easier for me. The cross by itself suffices for me. And then just over the page, um, she comes off with this wee one line, just talking about how, how to evaluate miracles. She says, since the cross produces the same effect upon me, the same effect upon me as the resurrection does, upon other people. The cross produces the same effect upon her as the resurrection does on other people. So the resurrection is no more important than the cross because she's only evaluating the cross and the resurrection and whatever other truths which are being you know, made by Catholicism by what effect they can produce on her, the spiritual illumination that they can bring about. It's not about whether or not these events actually occurred. And would not be a big deal if we ask the question, did the resurrection occur? And we're able to affirm, yes, that's not what the issue is for Veal. The issue is, what effect does that have on me? So when I look at the cross and when I look at the resurrection, of course the cross is going to seem more, you know, sort of um, <clears throat> kind of, you know, hard hitting. You know, we watch the passion of the Christ and we're like, oh my God, you know, can you imagine? Whereas the resurrection, you're kind of like, all right, okay. You know, it's a... The, 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 you know, so it turned out well in the end, happily ever after. Um, but yeah, the cross is what really kind of gets me spiritually and, you know, hits me at the heart. Um, uh, but if that's all you uh, evaluate religious claims for is how they are going to affect you, then um, you're approaching religion in completely the wrong way. You may as well approach, 
you know, um, religious claims the way you would approach Lord of the Rings. And that's just or, or a Kiss concert, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, you know what? What 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 has a greater effect on me, the Kiss concert or the Lord of the Rings or Dostoevsky? It'll never be Dostoevsky. That'll never have a good effect on me. Um, but that's just me. Uh, so I, 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 I agree with you as well, right? Yeah. So that that's a sorry, Gavin. Finish your thought, and then I'll chime in. Yep. Mm -hmm. The the one last thing I do want to say about that is that um, we were talking about reasoned, hard headed, you know, philosophical analysis. Uh, she she says there at the bottom of page thirty four, Hitler could die and return to life again fifty times, but I should still not look upon him as the son of God. Well, that's brilliant. Hitler could die and return to life again fifty times. All that would show is that Hitler wasn't resurrected because resurrection is not resuscitation. Resurrection is not resuscitation. And we who are in the weeds of the systematic theology and the philosophy know that. Lazarus was not resurrected. He was revivified, <laughs> right. Uh -huh. Exactly. I mean, people are resuscitated all the time. Um, and that's not resurrection. So, of course, Hitler dying and returning to life again 50 times is not going to prove he was the son of God. Because those 50 times would have just been resuscitations. They would have not been resurrections. Right. And, and, and let me let me also go back to the thing I was saying about context, right? So I see... We have lots of good comments and stuff in there. And, and Horseman is wondering if, if Buddhism could make similar predictions of Christianity. No, because a lot of Buddhism is atheistic, right? And I think classical theism can be philosophically demonstrated. So that's going to rule out a ton of Buddhism, right? Like philosophy does a lot more work here, Horseman, than I think you uh, you realize. Even if it gets other things right, good philosophy has a, has a narrowing and winnowing effect, even without making hyper-specific predictions. But I'll circle back to that. The other thing I want to say is... <laughs> Right. Um, when we when we look at miracle claims and try to evaluate miracle claims, we actually want some sort of criteria for evaluating mm. miracle claims. Hitler yeah. coming back to life again would be like very odd, even as a revivification, because it's not really in uh, a very um, religiously rich context. Right. Mm. Right. One yeah. of the reasons I wouldn't take seriously somebody saying that they just saw like a giant pink elephant pop out of nowhere is because it's just like so, so random right like like why right if, if any miracle claim is to be taken seriously it would be something that where you almost might expect a miracle uh to occur that has a very deep religious like religious significance right so this is part of what makes the resurrection really interesting is it's coming out of this great religious context with this tremendous anticipation suffused with religious uh um significance right it's not just like yeah it, it it exploded the world it was like a spiritual atom bomb going off and and uh and part of the new beliefs that came on the scene as you as you pointed out and nt right so brilliantly highlights like demand a, a really good explanation that seems that only that the that the actual traditional account of the resurrection can give but yeah i just i just want to say like the context of this is 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 really important that seems to be completely overlooked and the other thing is is like yeah, I guess if I'm going to ask, like, if God is going to perform miracles, like, in what context would a miracle sort of make sense, right? Uh, I'm not going to expect that God's just going to perform uh, miracles all the time. I think that God generally is going to just, you know, he puts natures in operation. He's going to he's going to work with natures, right? So a miracle, like, needs, like, it needs to signal something really significant and mm -hmm. really important. Um, so in that sense, I think... Um, I, it just, it, yeah, I guess it startles me that, 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 that these, like, this is what frustrated me about the book. Like these just like, kind of like quick dismissals of things that, um, I, if you ignore this, then I think almost the rest of the conversation to follow is going to be immensely uninteresting, uninteresting is, is the point mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. so yeah, pick, pick up from there and add whatever else you want. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, um, for me, uh, this has contemporary relevance because, um, not so much contemporary academic culture, but just contemporary culture at large, just doesn't engage with the idea that truth claims are being made here within religion, that, that Catholicism is making a truth claim, and we just need to step back and ask ourselves, well, do I think that's true or not? I don't think people, you know, generally, um, outside of academic circles or outside of, you know, uh, sort of, um, people who are just predisposed to kind of read the philosophy and theology anyway, I don't think people are really asking the question, well, do I actually think that Christ was resurrected? There, there, there seems to be kind of much more, well, I suppose you could call it a sedia, you know, kind of a, you know, a spiritual kind of slothfulness, um, spiritual closure as to whether or not 
um, we, we, we should even just you know take these questions seriously and, and ask whether or not um, truth claims are, are being made here. And um, I think that's one of the challenges that contemporary preachers, contemporary apologists need to face, that it's not so much getting the details right and showing that the counter arguments are just wrong, which is what, you know, kind of, you know, we academic philosophers, theologians and apologists, we all do. It's more getting people to ask that question. Do I think this is true? Do I think that, you know, Christ was resurrected, that he is the son of God incarnate? Uh, and I think that's the challenge um, for contemporary Christianity to, once again, permeate the culture with those kinds of questions so that people are faced with, you know, that question of whether or not, you know, they think what, what's being said here in Catholicism is true. Yeah. And it's a, it's a question of divine, like the resurrection is divine endorsement, right? So if, if that is totally irrelevant, like, oh yeah, you can admire somebody for certainly going to the cross, but then you just have essentially a, a man, right? This is where I guess Lewis's Lord Liar Lunatic <clears throat> picks up, who is probably like quite deranged, right? Um, made radical claims about himself. Um, and then yeah, suffered horrendous abuse and death, but then you just, you just have this failed Messiah and okay, are there certain virtues we can pick out of that? Sure. But it's also kind of like a really messed up story, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like the resurrection yeah. transforms all that. As you said, the resurrection is the lens, which we then go back and look through the entire ministry and life of Christ. Yeah. So yeah, yeah mm -hmm. to me, like without that, the rest of it is like at best sad and really actually kind of very weird and, and freaky in many ways, right? <laughs> yeah. That's just yeah. it, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, this sort of leads into the second point I wanted to engage with with Veal. Um, I mean, I think we spend a lot of time on that first point because I think that just permeates the entire book, just the, the lack of appreciation that truth claims are being made here, and so they need to be evaluated, evaluated as claims to truth. Um, but there's a, there's a second sort of issue which is here, and it's her conception of God as just the pure good itself, which we don't deny. Obviously, we do not deny that. Um, but the conception that she has of God throughout the letter is of one of pure, absolute goodness, again, very platonic um, notion of God. But it's to such an extent that she denies that God is an agent, that God exercises any agency whatsoever. Um, so uh, if God is just, she, see, she conceives of God just as this pure source of goodness, and it's almost um, mindless goodness. It's goodness to such an extent that God can't, help being good so that any conception of God any notion of religion or any religious belief which is in conflict with that or what veal would take to be instances of goodness cannot be a religion which comes from God and certainly can't be a religion which she claims to be doing God's will although she seems she doesn't seem to be too happy with the notion of God doing will on page let me see so page 45 of our edition, uh, chapter 34, a couple of pages into it. When talking about God's goodness, um, she says the following, God owes it to his own infinite goodness to give every creature good in all its fullness. God owes it in his own infinite goodness to give every creature good in all its fullness. Now, Pat, you and I know exactly what that's articulating. That's modal collapse. That's the idea that God, not only in being good, cannot help but shed, shed the rays of his goodness to others. So Thomas Aquinas was well aware of that position. Anybody who had engaged with Plato was well aware of that position. And anybody who affirms that God is an agent rejects that view for good reason. Because if God is utterly simple, omniscient, subject to nothing, then he's not subject to a distinct nature, i.e. the good, by which he is constrained to act in a certain way. Yep. God yep. does not owe it to his own goodness to give every creature good because no creature is owed God's goodness. No creature exists to merit God's goodness because their very existence is an act of God's goodness. So no creature is owed any of God's goodness. God may choose to grant goodness to creatures to manifest his own goodness, but no creature has that claim upon God's goodness. And the reason why um, I kind of, you know, focus on this is that um, because of that view of Veils, 
that you know God owes it to his own goodness to grant creatures as much goodness as possible. She sees the basic state of every creature, not just as one of being good, which we as Catholics agree with, but as one of being redeemed. Mm. They are implicitly redeemed. Okay, that is their basic state. They're redeemed. And um, the basic state is one of salvation, unless a creature does something to drive away salvation, I commit a moral fault. So if you have a religion which is based on a sacramental economy, the way Catholicism is, that your basic state is not one of redemption, but your basic state because of the fall is um, one of damnation. And you require a redeemer who, you know, becomes incarnate, is resurrected and institutes the sacraments by which you can be redeemed. Um, Veal is going to reject that. Um, she doesn't see a religion based on a sacramental economy as adding anything of value or positivity because she sees the basic state of creatures as being one of being redeemed because oh God owes us, you know, out of his goodness, our redemption. In chapter three, uh, page seven of our edition, um, she says the following. If the redemption with the sensible signs and means corresponding to it had not been present on this earth from the very beginning, it would not be possible to pardon God. So do you hear that? If the redemption had not been there from the very beginning, we couldn't pardon God. God would be at fault. If one may use such words without blasphemy, she clarifies. For the affliction of so many innocent people, so many people uprooted, enslaved, tortured, and put to death in the course of centuries preceding the Christian era. Christ is present on this earth unless men drive him away. Well, no, he's not. <laughs> and that's precisely the truth claims that you know Christianity is making, that Christ comes present on this earth, not by default. Christ isn't here by default. Christ is here as a rescue operation. Yes, right. Christ is a savior, so we are in need of a savior, whereas Veal thinks that Christ is here by default. And so we don't need a savior. We're just, the, the Christ is always just here anyway, because God owes it out of his infinite goodness to um, be here with us and to, you know, give that goodness to us. I have other passages um, to read in relation to this as well, but I think this influences why Veal doesn't take the resurrection and the incarnation seriously, because you only would take the resurrection and the incarnation seriously if you think that humanity is in need of a receive, of saviour and in need of redemption. But if we're not in need of redemption, then all we have is religious imagery. That's all that we have, religious imagery. You know, really kind of, you know, really gripping stories such as the crucifixion and, you know, Christ's, you know, uh, I don't know, when we're about to stone the, the lady caught in, you know, adultery, you know, Christ's intervention. There are all these very gripping sort of stories we have in the gospel, but the resurrection and the incarnation, no, they, they don't really matter because Beale doesn't seem to think um, that we need this redeemer. And so um, just a couple of other passages here. Yeah, chapter 8, the opening of chapter 8, page 15, Veal mm -hmm. writes, Every time that a man has, with a pure heart called upon Osiris, Dionysius, Krishna, Buddha, the Tao, etc., the Son of God has answered him by sending the Holy Spirit. So every time somebody with a pure heart calls upon these, you know, false gods um, or, you know, prophets, you know, of different religions, um, God is that the Son of God has answered him by sending the Holy Spirit. Um, how do you know? <laughs> you know, I, 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 there, there, there's clearly just it, this reminded me um, of you know a lot of the religious pluralism that I read before I was actually Christian, right? Um, so yes. it reminded me of like Huxley's perennial philosophy, which yeah. is quite full of just like of assertion like this with almost very little support. And then the funny thing is, is when you actually go and you, uh, and she, and she, she just makes a lot of these religions sound a lot more similar than they actually are. When you study, them. Mm. that's part mm. of the problem, right? Like this mm. sounds nice on the surface, but when you dive deeper and you start to study these religions, you realize, Oh no, they're actually quite divergent in more radical ways. than a lot of people are willing to, to admit um and you know like there's there's like i guess a superficial appeal there was to me even when i was um thinking about this too like it's it kind of sounds nice all religions are like false but true and so like there's two ways of thinking about religious pluralism right there's like the the naive version which is all religions are saying the same thing through and through that's not even a kindergartner can believe that right mm -hmm. then there's a slightly more sophisticated version where it says all religions are kind of false but also kind of true in a sense, right? They're false because none of them gets it completely right. 
except for yeah. Simone Veil, right? She gets it right. <laughs> but they're all groping towards like that same transcendent, the absolute good that sends all of them the Holy Spirit, right? So she's really kind yeah. of somewhat more on the, I guess, this, I, I hesitate to call it the more sophisticated religious program because I don't think it's theologically sophisticated at all. I think when you actually study more in depth the theological, different theological systems and religions and traditions, all of this starts to completely break down, which is exactly what happened for me, right? I'm like, well, this thesis just doesn't hold up at all when you actually begin to take serious research into these matters. But I'll grant, like, it's there's a superficial attractiveness to this. And I was, again, initially attracted to this line of thought, but I ultimately found it unsustainable and became convinced by the arguments for including the historical arguments for Christianity at the end of the day. So, sorry, I just wanted to mention that, you know, at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think what's running under that, and there's a final passage I want to read here from Veal um, with regard to this issue, what's running throughout that whole religious pluralism view and the view that Veal is holding here is that all it takes for us to be able to kind of um, grow close to God is to be good in our hearts, to be morally good or something like that, that that's all it takes. And um, if I just read this last passage, then it'll sort of, you know, get into what I just said there. Um, in chapter 12, the last few paragraphs of chapter 12, pages 2021 20, of our edition, she writes, as in the West, the word God taken in its usual meaning signifies a person, men whose attention, faith, and love are almost exclusively concentrated on the impersonal aspect of God can actually believe themselves and declare themselves to be atheists, even though supernatural love inhabits their souls. Such an early theory. No. Up, oh, hold uh, on. Just, uh, Gavin, um, re rewind the tape about 10, 15 seconds. You were breaking up there a little bit in the connection. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry about that. So she's talking about um, people um, who have concentrated on the impersonal aspect of God, I, you know, his goodness and all of that, uh, and they believe and declare themselves to be atheists, even though supernatural love inhabits their souls, she says. She says that such men who focusing just on the impersonal aspects, supernatural love inhabiting their souls, um, they declare themselves to be atheists. She says that such men are surely saved. Such men are surely saved. Now, um, I think the only time uh, in Catholicism that we would ever say that such people are, that, that the people are surely saved is the canonized saints because we have, you know, evidence of miraculous interventions. And so we know these people are close to God. So not even, you know, Catholicism, you know, with all its sophistication about salvation would say something like, you know, something as kind of, you know, universal as that, that all these people, you know, to an individual are surely saved. We would say that there is a sure way to salvation, which is through the sacraments. And that's the individual then, you know, to participate in the sacraments. And that we would say that people like St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, all these canonized saints are surely saved because we have evidence of, you know, their intervention. But we never say something that is general like this, that such are surely saved. Um, but she goes on. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, they would be recognized by their attitude with regard to the things of this world. All those who possess in its pure state, the love of their neighbor and the acceptance of the order of the world, including affliction, all those, even should they live and die to all appearance, atheists, again, are surely saved. The point she's making here and the point that she's made, she makes sense throughout the letter is that so long as you conform your life to the good, you've done enough. OK, you're saved because your basic state is one of redemption. So as long as you continue conforming your life to the good and don't fall away from the good, well, your redemption is just going to continue. There's kind of like a redemptive inertia, a salvific inertia that so long as you don't, you know, knock yourself off course, you're just going to stay on course and you just remain redeemed. But, um, you know, Catholicism, Christianity, even, you know, ancient Israel, even the ancient philosophers knew the reality of original sin. They didn't call it that, but they knew the reality of original sin. They knew that what humanity, that humanity was capable of so much more. Mm -hmm. And yet there was something about us, not evil, but just which kind of kept pulling us back from reaching, you know, the good that we were capable of. There seemed to be something in our nature which was drawing us to the good, but also something which frustratingly was pulling us back from the good, which we recognize as original sin, you know, of the story of the fall and um, all of that. Given that, our basic state is not one of being redeemed. 
so we can be as good as good can be. That's not going to make us holy. That's not enough to make us holy. We can have all the cardinal virtues. Doesn't make us holy. Doesn't make yeah, us it also it also sort of begs the question about what we mean by good as well in a in a deep yeah. way. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, let, let's give Veal the benefit of the doubt and you know, maybe some Platonic or Neoplatonic um notion of the good, or even the Aristotelian. Um, we could be, you know, perfect, we could be Socrates like that. Okay, now so let's let's set aside, you know, Socrates is pre-Christian and might very well have had access to extra sacramental grace. Well, to to grace outside the sacraments. Um, but you know, you could be somebody like Socrates, and um you, you know, you could have all the virtues. But that's not enough to make you holy. That will dispose you to accepting the gift of God's grace when offered. You will be well disposed to accept it. And you'll be well disposed to accept Christ if you live the good life. But it's Christ. It is God who makes you holy. That's the whole point. That God is the one who comes after us, the good shepherd. You know, we're the ones who have strayed. We can't be holy by ourselves. So he comes after us to bring us back, to make us holy. We can be strayed and can be perfectly good, okay? And, you know, have all the virtues and everything and still be strayed, the lost sheep. We need the shepherd to come after us to make us holy, to bring us back to himself. Without him, we just can't be holy. And this is something, again, relating it back to the contemporary culture. The contemporary culture doesn't understand about Christianity, at least in my um, estimation, that when we say that we can't be holy without God, we're not saying we can't be good without God. Goodness is a necessary but not sufficient condition for holiness. For holiness. Just, because, just because you're good doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. right. you, you have all the virtues. It doesn't mean you're getting to heaven. It's Christ that gets you to heaven. And this is something that Veal doesn't seem to appreciate. And I think she doesn't appreciate it. Given, given the letter, because she thinks her basic state is one of being redeemed. Yeah, and the other thing I want to point out here that was all excellent, Gavin, is the just the notion of redemption. Like, in one sense, you have this sort of pluralism lurking in the background, but then this commitment to something that is hyper-Christian, right? <laughs> right? Mm. But then a disagreement with what the tradition, with what the Christian t uh, tradition teaches about redemption, right? You don't hear about yeah. redemption in Buddhism, right? It's just not, mm -hmm. it's just not a concept there, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, he's escaping the cycle of samsara, sure, right? But it's yeah. just, so it's just like, what is go going on here? It's just, it's just, it, it's so messy in so many different ways, and it's kind mm -hmm. of wanting to just have so many things at once, and just, yeah, I just, this was the stuff that kind of sent, frustrated me throughout yeah. like in one sense you kind of like want to reject christianity and pluralize everything yet you're committed to things that are clearly christian but you're not committed to the christian commitment of those commitments yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. what yeah. is going on here this is a this is a carnival for sure <coughs> anyways yeah keep, I think, keep going yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think that hits the nail on the head and i think what's being teased out here are general themes running throughout um veal's letter which you know we're obviously exercising her thinking but they kind of, almost like a priori, they affect how she reads Christianity and Christian claims. And that kind of gets gets us to this third issue that I want to bring up about her attitude towards faith and what faith is and what faith involves. Um, can we maybe move on to that? Would that be? Yes, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah that, the time is right. Yes, let's do it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so she talks about the dogmas and truth claims that dogmas make. And in chapter 26, page 36 of our edition, she states that the mysteries of the faith are not a proper object for the intelligence considered as a faculty permitting affirmation or denial. So there you have it. The dogmas of the faith are not a proper object for intelligence considered as a faculty permitting affirmation or denial. We're not meant to affirm or deny the dogmas. So God help the first seven ecumenical councils, you know, which affirmed this, that, and the other dog. And, and she does bring ecumenical councils in, you know, for, for criticism. But, you know, God help Christology, you know, God help, you know, all, all sorts of things, because, you know, we're not meant to affirm any of these. Um, as she says, they are not of the order of truth, but they are above it. So they're above truth. Um, now, here we're in the funny sort of metaphysical territory, you know, what is above truth? Um, the only part of the human soul which is capable of any real contact with them, that is the dogmas, is the faculty of supernatural love. It alone, therefore, is capable of an adherence in regard to them. So there's this faculty of supernatural love from us. I, I think she might mean charity, what we typically mean by charity by that. Uh, and just at the bottom of the page, uh, 36, she says, the virtue of charity is the exercise 
of the faculty of supernatural love, the virtue of faith is the subordination of all the soul's faculties to the faculty of supernatural love. And now I've got an article coming out on faith um, uh, as it was defined at the First Vatican Council and then uh, through the history of the church. Um, and I've got this article coming out. And so when I read that, that um, the virtue of faith is the subordination of all the soul's faculties to the faculty of supernatural love, I just thought to myself, no, it isn't. Uh, <laughs> what, what, where's that? I mean, what, what? she doesn't give it any justification for that. And she talks about the definition of faith at the Council of Trent. So um, in chapter 14, the first paragraph of chapter 14, page 22, she states, the definition of faith, according to the Catechism of the Council of Trent, and then she puts in brackets, firm belief in everything taught by the church. And then she goes on to say it's very far removed from what's from that of St. John and, you know, all the rest. Um, <clears throat> so she presents the, the definition of faith, according to the Catechism of Trent, as firm belief in everything taught by the church. Well, having just written an article on this, which is being published, I know what the definition of faith is at the Council of Trent. And it's not that. It is absolutely not that. Um, for the gentle listeners, if they want to know what the definition of faith is from the Council of Trent, they can open up the Council of Trent. They can go to Section 6, Chapter 6, and they will see that faith is defined as the free movement in which one believes what God reveals because it is God who reveals it. It is a free movement, okay, so it's an activity of the will through which one believes what God has revealed because God has revealed it. What does that mean? Because God is your beloved, because you've fallen in love with God, he is the good itself. When God reveals something to you, you trust him that he's telling the truth. So that when my wife, let's say, so my wife is my beloved, you know, Pat, you know, Christine, you know, says something to you, says, you know, Pat, um, you know, she's on the phone to you, you're out at the birthday party, you're coming home, I'm making dinner, I'm making X, Y, and Z. You don't go, ah, really, are you? Now prove that to me. I need proof of that. I'm going to need some, you know, ju justification for that true belief. You don't. You're just thinking, well, okay, right. <laughs> you know, you're my wife. I've got no reason to doubt you. So, well, obviously that's going to be true. I'm going to assent to that because I have fought, because, because you're my beloved. My will is, you know, attached to you. My intellect is carried along with it. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why Veal holds that, um, we don't um, uh, affirm the dogmas intellectually is because she thinks that you can't, you know, affirm something volition volitionally. You can't affirm something with your will. Affirming something by your intellect and adhering to it by your intellect is never free. So um, she says here, uh, yes, in chapter 27, with regard to the dogmas, page 38 of our edition, she says, we owe the definitions with which the church has thought it right to surround the mysteries of faith, and more particularly its condemnations, a permanent and unconditional attitude of respectful attention, but not an adherence. Why do we not owe it an adherence? Well, the two paragraphs down, intellectual adherence is never owed to anything whatsoever, for it is never in any degree vol a voluntary thing. Attention alone is voluntary, and it alone forms the subject of an obligation. And I've just written in a wee note beside this. Well, I'm sort of obligated to my beloved, to my wife, that whenever she tells me, you know, something, um, I don't really doubt what she's telling me because she's my beloved. Um, you know, my will is attached to her and that carries with it my intellectual sense. So that when she says to me, you know, Gavin, you know, I'm going to be at home when you get back from work, you know, I look forward to seeing you, you know, I'll have the coffee ready. I'm not like, well, is that a justified true belief? You know, <laughs> I'm not starting to go through the various justifications for that. I'm just like, Right, well, okay, I mean, that's just how it works. Um, and that's what faith involves. Faith involves both the affirmation of the intellect to particular truths, 14 of them, from the you know, Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed that we say every week at Mass. There's 14 truths that we affirm by our intellect. Why do we affirm them? Because God, with whom we have fallen in love and who is our beloved, had, draws our will to himself, and then drawing our will, our intellect then is drawing is drawn to affirm those truths so that whenever something is proposed by God, we believe it with our intellect volitionally on the basis of our will. So it is a volitional, a free activity, as the Council of Trent says, 
It is a free activity by which we believe what God has revealed because God has revealed it. Right, so, right. Mm -hmm. So whenever Veal says on page 22, you know, chapter 14, that the definition of faith from the Council of Trent is firm belief in everything taught by the church, she is 100% mistaken. That what she's, she actually she's just wrong. Just wrong. Yes, right. She's literally just wrong. Mm -hmm. And what she goes on to say in the next paragraph, well, two paragraphs down, the Thomist conception of faith. Now, the Thomist conception of faith is the one that I just articulated there, right? Okay. It's believing what one's beloved has revealed because he is one's beloved. That's the Thomist definition of faith. If you don't believe me, you can go to the Summa Theology, I, Secunda Secunda, the treatise on faith, you'll get it there. Um, or you can read my article, which is coming out later this year. Right. But no, Veal says, the Thomist conception of faith implies a totalitarianism, a stifling is that of Hitler. A stifling is that of Hitler. Thomas's conception of faith as believing what one's beloved has revealed is totalitarian. <laughs> as, as totalitarian as that of Hitler, if not more so. Um, y you can imagine when I read this. It's just an ins it's just an insane statement, right? It's hard to take things like that um, seriously and and it not significantly color how you yeah. read the rest of of this type of writing. So, mm. yeah, even if that's how you feel about something, you should you know maybe be prudent about putting that in without deeper reflection right and realizing is this at all a reasonable thing to say right <laughs> yeah, well, yeah i mean now obviously she didn't think this was going to be published okay so th this is a letter to a priest but what i do want to say here um and this is the last uh, this is the sort of last point here, is that whilst that her, her account of what trent teaches and what the thomas view is is just factually incorrect and in fact what the thomas view teaches is actually close to what veal seems to think uh, the nature of faith should be like, except the Thomist position allows what Veals doesn't allow, i.e. intellectual adherence. One thing that I do want to say is that if faith doesn't, um, you know, involve intellectual adherence, then we have a real problem here. We have a very real problem here that, um, you know, if the, if the mysteries of faith and the dogmas of faith are not subject to intellectual adherence, and, this, and it's as follows, we can only love what we know. Okay, so Veal thinks that, you know, what we owe to God is supernatural love, right? We can only love what we know. Yeah, but I couldn't love my wife and you couldn't love your wife if you didn't know her, if you didn't come to get to know her, you know, in the first place. And the more you get to know somebody and the more years you spend with them, the deeper that love and that bond becomes. So you can only love what you know. Now, if I can't know God through the mysteries, if I can't affirm the mysteries of the faith, then I can't know God. And if I can't do that, how can I love God? How can I love God that I, do, uh, that I do not know? That's the whole point of Scripture. That's the whole point of the incarnation. Because God is so transcendentally other, he makes himself available to us through revelation, uh, you know, ultimately through Christ, so that we can know him, that we have a mediator by which God can be known, and so we can fall in love with him. So there has to be some sort of intellectual component to our faith that we affirm so that we know who it is that we're loving. It's not just some sort of blind mystical ascent. And even mystical ascents aren't blind because, you know, St. Teresa of Avila, you read her stuff, you know, about entering the inner sanctum and, you know, finding Christ there. You know, it's all very beautiful stuff. She knows full well who she's finding. OK, it's not this leap into the darkness. It's this leap into the light, which is Christ. Um, now, Veal likes the mysticism. She seems to think mysticism is, you know, where it's at in all these religious traditions. Um, but it's certainly not a mysticism that, you know, e even, you know, the, the, our medieval mystics, such as, you know, St. Catherine, the Cloud of Unknowing, um, and St. Teresa of Avila would have affirmed, because for them, the darkness that they talk about in the mystical ascent is a darkness of, you know, um, super excessive light. The light is so bright, it comes across as a darkness. That's in Pseudo Dionysius. You get that, and you, you find that, you know, in John's Code of Sarah Eugene as well, that the light is so overpowering that it's experienced as a darkness. Mm -hmm. Whereas Veal seems to think that the, the mysticism, the falling in love of God, is a kind of a leap into the darkness, so that there's no intellectual component, but you're somehow magnetically drawn, you know, to that darkness anyway. And I think that as well is, you know, very much prevalent 
in our contemporary age and it's a part of our culture that we have to um, challenge that you know falling in love of god and being drawn to god happens through a mediator which you know originally for the israelites was um scripture uh, and for us is christ um because our contemporary culture has rejected the whole idea that we could even take seriously the resurrection and the incarnation of christ because veal you know she rejects you know that we should even take seriously the resurrection and the incarnation we don't need to take seriously then the, the idea of this divine mediator who can bring us to god and if yeah. we don't have a divine mediator who can bring us to god then how do we connect with god well we go up a mountain we enter into mindfulness you know we do something like that and we try to connect with the great spirit um of everything which is not what christ wanted which is not what christianity holds and so veal asks at the beginning of this letter can one affirm these things and still be a Christian? Well, no, one can't affirm these things and still be a Christian. And given the discussion that we've had, there doesn't seem to be any reason to affirm these things that Veal articulates. Right, and one shouldn't affirm them anyways, correct. Right. Yeah. That's what I would say, yeah. Yeah, excellent, Gavin. That was that was really helpful, a blast. I'm actually glad we got to spend some time with this because I know it's, a, it's very influential and that was a really helpful and illuminating discussion and i hope that our gentle listeners were benefited by it in in uh more than one way uh yeah you you summarized it well i don't know if there's any other like concluding thoughts you want to mention about that or if maybe we should just tease our next conversation or <laughs> or whatever. yeah i suppose the concluding thought for me is that um i initially came to this um because a lot of people um uh, professional colleagues professional philosophers theologians whose you know, opinions I do value and take seriously. Um, <clears throat> uh, they, they really enjoy Simone Veil. And, you know, I mean, I'm engaged with a lot of her other work as well and with, you know, her um, biography and everything. And, um, okay, you can appreciate Veal as, you know, a struggling, you know, sort of very existentially, you know, motivated thinker. Fine. Wonderful. You know, you know, biographies are always great to read and it's always great to be inspired by these people. Um, and you can be inspired by that. But I just don't get what is so valuable in that thought. I really don't. And actually, I think maybe, um, you know, this letter to a priest, if somebody was, you know, sort of questioning and concerned and, you know, maybe was wanting to know what they should do um, with regard to entering Christianity, I wouldn't recommend the letter to a priest. And, um, I really wouldn't because one's concerns wouldn't be assuaged. One's sort of existential musings wouldn't be assuaged. They would, in fact, be reinforced and there would be even less. Le the, one, one wouldn't come out more confident. And, and, you would, and you would hold a number of falsities and caricatures by reading it as well, right? Yes. But you would yes. be rejecting, as Gavin demonstrated, even including with interpretations of what councils teach, is just wrong. It's just wrong, right? It's, yeah. it's not even the incomplete. It's just wrong. I would, yeah. however, if you're searching, highly recommend this book, as Gavin pointed out many times. This was uh, mm. N.T. Wright's The Resurrection of the Son of God. It's a, it's an investment, but it's a page turner. Like, it's, it's oh, yeah. actually, yeah, it's just, it's phenomenal, so... It is, and N.T. Wright writes brilliantly. He, he really does. Mm -hmm. um, so, Gavin, we had an idea for another conversation that happened pretty soon. Do we? Want, I think it, I've been enjoying these kind of, you know, we often do kind of the just the, the deep metaphysics, so I enjoy these uh, different types of conversations. What do we have coming up yeah. next? Do you want to tease that for our gentle listeners here? Yeah, so Pat and I were just, you know, sort of chatting, and it's... It's an issue that I saw coming up in um, one of our kind of, you know, philosophy theology groups that, you know, we have on Facebook that we're both, you know, members of, as I'm sure the gentle listeners are as well. Um, but it's also one which I've noticed coming up in general Catholic society or Christian society um, at large. And that's the idea of courtship, of biblical courtship or Catholic courtship and what that involves. And I was just reading... Um, a kind of the, the, the discussion and a few blog posts and I was actually quite surprised that um, a lot of uh, tr traditional Catholics um, and I wouldn't be a trolley Catholic myself I would just be a, a Catholic I just take myself to be a Catholic uh, some people put that on the traditional side but I don't know how far you can go with that um, but a lot of these uh, traditional Catholics have very weird ideas about what acceptable courtship is um, which, you know, involves chaperoning, not holding hands, 
all of that sort of stuff. So Pat and I were just going back and forth over it because it was a point. Of Dating advice from Doctor <laughs> Kerr. I love it. That's gonna be the next. That's gonna be the next one. Yeah. <laughs> well, we were just going over it, and we just thought, God, this is, you know, we we need to shine a kind of you know a philosopher's eye on this because there's a whole moral dimension to these discussions. And yeah. um, one of the discussions that I was reading um, in the discussion group, the whole focus seemed to be, well, look, if you're going to go into courtship with somebody, if a boy and girl are going to start dating, well, you have to avoid this, 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 and this. And the whole idea is that so long as you avoid sin, well, then you can earn heaven. So as long as you avoid sin, well, God's just going to give you heaven. There is no discussion no discussion of the formation of character. And I was sitting thinking, well, maybe if you're courting, if a guy and a girl are, you know, dating each other, maybe they should focus more on the characters that they're forming and how their characters are growing and developing as a relationship deepens uh, and, you know, grows rather than just avoiding all of these things. Uh, because, uh-huh, uh-huh. because one doesn't become virtuous just by avoiding just sin. Just by avoiding, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, you don't become, you know, as Aristotle points out, you don't become a lover of truth just because you avoid lying. That's mm. what that's how you as children. You know, you tell them not to lie, but at some point the, the habit develops of always telling the truth and being a lover of truth and taking delight in the truth. Okay. And that's not just not lying, that's actually gaining some disposition towards the good. Yes. Um, right. So if courting couples are just you know, um, avoiding, you know, all sin and all occasions for sin, where's the space there for developing character and the proper and the virtues proper to courtship? Mm. There isn't any. And so um, this was all part and parcel of, you know, this discussion that I was just following. And I just thought, you know, it'd be good to kind of, you know, um, get we're, into this. We're, we're doing it. So Don says dating advice from Aquinas, exactly what I needed. So we're going to, that'll be our next episode. I think that's going to be, Oh, be, oh. Yeah. I've seen Aquinas, I've seen Aquinas being deputized as defending this, you know, this very rigid, you know, sort of, you know, um, Catholic courtship or biblical courtship, and and he's nothing of the sort. So yeah, yeah. So uh, Callum says, are you guys going to take a few questions? Uh, yeah, Gavin, you got a few minutes. Yeah. We'll maybe just take a, just quickly send some in. Um, yeah. Sorry, guys, I'm just a little disorganized today because I was just rushing from one place to another. But uh, if you got something quick, uh, please send it in. I, I see there's been a lot of discussion going on. That's cool. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm not going to be able to scroll up and just weed through all of that. Um, so if you just have a question, please submit it now. Unless, Gavin, you see anything that you want to highlight or take. Mm-hmm. I see, I see Mongoose Man way back at, the, back at the beginning. Is your guest from Ulster? Yes, I'm from Ulster. Um, I'm from Belfast, Northern Ireland. So, yeah, I'm within the province of Ulster, Mongoose Man, just to let you know. That is something I did not know. Yeah. Um, all right, here's a question, Gavin. Um, I don't know if this is going to open another two-hour conversation <laughs> so maybe like if you want to just put like a to be continued on this one maybe just a brief answer to Ju- uh to julio or julio excuse me he says question for gavin what are the greatest points of harmony between the pittsburgh school and thomism and what are the greatest uh oh, tension so for people who aren't familiar we've we've <laughs> talked about the pittsburgh school in previous conversations especially with jim so i'm just maybe yeah. we can just assume some background knowledge here and take it from there gavin uh-huh sure sure yeah mm-hmm. so uh yeah as you say we've discussed this with jim madden and um you know uh i, I told a few people that i was going to be appearing on this tonight so i hope at least one person who's engaged with the pittsburgh school and kant and you know the whole Kantian tradition um is watching this um so he can get my input uh, <laughs> He knows my input anyway, but what are the greatest, you know, sort of connections there? What I think is the sort of most significant connection between the Pittsburgh School and Thomism is that in the Pittsburgh School, there's an appreciation for this distinction that Kant makes between empirical realism and transcendental idealism. Kant continually affirms that he's an empirical realist, that the content of our experiences comes from the real empirical contact that we have with objects. The transcendental idealism comes insofar as that there has to be something in us which is brought into operation when that contact with empirical objects comes. And that's our thought. That's our intellect. Our intellect is awoken when we come into contact with objects. That's Kant's whole whole point. Intuitions without concepts are blind. Thoughts without intuitions are empty. 
What does that mean? That means that the content of intuition or perceptions is the content of thought. It is the same content, not a different content, but the same content. So when we get hit by an empirical object, it brings into operation our thinking capacities. Our intellect is brought into operation. Now, who else says that? Aquinas, De Veritate, question one, chapter one, being is what the intellect first conceives and to which it reduces all its conceptions. So what brings the intellect into operation? It's being. For Kant, what brings our intellectual, con our conceptual operations into operation? It's empirical objects. They're saying the same thing, and that goes back to Aristotle. The Anima, chapter three, when we experience, chapter three, book three, when we experience objects, the intellect then has a kind of an agency to it where it strives to understand what we are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so the agency of the intellect is brought into operation. It's awoken, it's excited by the objects that it experiences. That Pittsburgh reading of Kant is one which I think um, rearticulates the Thomist Aristotelian conception that um, intellect is brought into operation uh, by being. What are the greatest tensions? Um, <clears throat> well, the way some of them articulate it, well, Sellers, like, okay, so Sellers is the founder of that school. Um, in empiricism and the philosophy of mind and in uh, being and being known, where he engages with um, the Thomas position. So being and being known was a paper he had published in American Catholic Bill Quarterly. Sellers, the founder of the Pittsburgh School, um, I don't think he knew he was the founder at the time, but, you know, he was the founder. Um, distinguishes between um, perceptual experience, perceptual experience, which is not intentional, okay, which is not intentional. It's more representational and intellectual understanding, which is intentional. Um, so uh, there's kind of, you know, this dual level where you have conceptual content at the level of understanding, but you don't have it at the level of experience. You just have representation. And this is an issue, but this is an issue, and that's an issue of disconnect with Aquinas, and Seller says that, but this is also an issue within the Pittsburgh School itself, because members of the Pittsburgh School have criticized Sellers on this very point for feeling to appreciate an insight that the Thomas position had that Sellers just couldn't see. Right. Um, McDowell has criticized Sellers for that, for not appreciating Aquinas um, on this score. So there, there, there is a tension there, this is one that I can be overcome, I think. Awesome. Very helpful, Gavin. And we will continue that conversation with Jim at some point. I've been wanting to get you guys both back on and for a, for a show here. Uh, let's take this one from Callum. Uh, Callum says, uh, Gavin, who is your favorite author on the resurrection? Well, I'll assume other than scriptural authors, um, at, you know, it probably has to be anti right? Um, I like Gary Habermas. Um, his, his, his work is the work that I've read by him uh, is more sort of apologetical. He brought out that book with, it was um, Habermas and, is it Lincona? Is that uh, Mike, Mike Lincona, yeah. He's got a, yeah. a decent, I don't like his work as much as I like N.T. Wright or the yeah. McGrew. I also like uh, Lydia McGrew a lot mm, and Tim McGrew yeah, yeah. on it yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, N.T. Wright is just, th that that book is monumental. That, mm -hmm. you know, that, that just swallowed up all of the previous, you know, literature on the subject and, you can't read anything after N.T. Wright without reading N.T. Wright on the yeah. resurrection. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, you could just read that. That should be the first book you read on the resurrection and then find out from there. I agree. If you are serious in the historical analysis, this is this is the one. In fact, I first made the mistake of getting it on Kindle. <laughs> yeah, no, you can't. <laughs> and then I, uh, I just, I, and I usually don't do that. I'm, I'm very much, I prefer paper guy, but I think it was just, uh, I forget there was some pricing incentive or something, and almost immediately mm. I'm like, no, I, I need, I need the, 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 the real thing here. So I can't recommend mm. it highly enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. All right, let's take one or two more here. Uh, Don, he's been a uh, uh, great uh, contributor here in the comments, wants to know, are you amazed at how much truth, uh, this is, I think, for you, Gavin, at how much truth ancient philosophers, Socrates, Plato, et cetera, discovered without any known uh, special revelation? Yeah, absolutely. Always, continually. Um, just, you know, how much they were able to think through and elucidate. Um, in such a short period of time, you got Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and the Stoics. I mean, let, let us not forget the Stoics. Um, you, you just have so, so much good philosophy there in such a condensed period of history um, without any special re revelation. It's always a wonder to me that that happened. 
Now, how did that happen? Well, obviously, everything is, you know, with under, under the providence, providence of God, of course. Um, and so, I mean, I have no doubt that, you know, God is preparing, you know, the world for the acceptance of Christianity, you know, through, you know, good philosophy and all that. But there's always these interconnections that God, God is a master strategist, okay? He knows what he's doing. So, I mean, setting all that aside, taking God out of the equation, um, it's fascinating the historical conditions that had to, you know, that come together so that you could have so much good philosophy, good and true philosophy occur in this small geographical region within this small period of time, just over a few, you know, centuries. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's similar to the 13th century, okay, to the, the high middle ages when you had those major scholastics, um, Albert, Bonaventure, Aquinas, Scotus, and Occam. These five big scholastics, and then we're discovering all these other authors, maybe not as major as them, but all these other authors as well who are worth engaging. Godfrey of Fontaine, Giles of Rome, Henry of Ghent, James of Turbo, people like that, um, who, whose work is just, you know, it hasn't even been transcribed, let alone translated. Um, uh, all well worth engaging. There was another period which he had all this great philosophy uh, coming out. Um, and, you know, the, the historical situation just seemed to be right. And then with Kant and post-Kantian philosophy, German idealism. Again, you have this great philosophy happening in Germany at the time, and the historical conditions just seem to be right um, for that occurring. Um, so there are all these periods that I, I am just amazed at and I'm fascinated um, about how uh, the, just a bunch of philosophers got together and were able to produce so much good work. And obviously, ancient Greece, Athens, um, is always going to be the most fascinating since you have these pivotal figures that everybody looks at. Mm, yeah, absolutely. All right, I want to thank uh, everybody who tuned in live. Good to see uh, a lot of familiar faces. Well, I guess screen names. Uh, Brendan, Don, <laughs> Horseman, Callum, great to see all of you here. Thank you all for supporting the channel. And uh, thank you, Gavin, as always, for a very stimulating and, and fruitful conversation. It's always a joy. And it's always, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's just really cool that you take this time to uh, join us and bring this the value to the channel here. So we really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's always good crack. Anyway, you know, coming on, getting to chat about stuff that we love. Um, Any, anything else you want to plug or mention real quick before, before we go? I mean, even just your radio show again, make sure people are aware of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so anybody who wants to tune into the radio show, um, it's uh, Radio Maria Ireland, um, and we're on every Thursday at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, every, so every Thursday, 2 p.m., and so on Faith and Reason. So it's myself, and I've got a co-host who's just like awesome co-host, you know, just brilliant at, you know, just kneeling down the questions and stopping me going off on one. Um, <laughs> and it's the, the sort of um, discussion, so on Faith and Reason issues, um, it's maybe not so much at this level. It's maybe a level down from this. It's 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 for you know a kind of an audience, a gentle listener that hasn't really engaged an awful lot with philosophy before, but wants to kind of has a mind and a, a you know a heart for you know engaging with these issues. So it's pitched at that sort of level. Um, but it's you know it's great fun and um, it's really good doing it. Uh, got an awesome co-host who is really able to kind of just hit the nail on every you know sort sort of question, everything. So you know. It, it's great doing that, but check it out. I mean, a lot of our videos are up now on YouTube, you know, Radio Maria Ireland. Um, other than that, we've got the conference coming up on in April, uh, April beginning April 27th. Um, it's going to be awesome, running April 27th to 30th. Uh, we've got a ton of great philosophers coming to St. Patrick's um, May News. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I'm presenting the paper at it. Um, I need to write the paper. Um, I'm presenting a paper at it, and there'll be a lot of others presenting that as well at it as well. Uh, David Bentley Hart's uh, going to be there. Um, Ed Fieser isn't going to be there. Otherwise, we would need security. We need a bo uh, yeah, boxing ring at that, that yeah. point. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's going to be good crack. Um, and I'm really excited about it. And this has been a couple of years in the making. Right. Everything, you know, putting it off. So it's going to be like the big event of the year, kind of in and around the UK, with all these, you know, 20 keynote speakers. Wow. Wow. Uh, um so yeah that that's a great thing and then as i say i've just got all these various publications coming out here there and everywhere um and i've got this article on the third way which has just appeared i'm getting the off print some monday from my colleague in, let's in do, let's do an episode on that i would love to on the third way yeah, yeah. 
yeah we should yeah i'm happy yeah. to do that let's, let's do let's do three and four because we wanted to do four anyway so let's just just go go three and four that'd be that'd be great mm -hmm. three three and four because we'll sure, we did that whole series with carlo but that was like two years ago now where we went through the yeah. five ways so we're, we're kind of due for for an update on that i'm sure people would like that so let's do it that'd be sweet mm -hmm. absolutely i mean if the gentle listeners have you know three or four hours you know to just talk <laughs> listen to us talk about thomas in the third and fourth way that's fine you know we can get into that it'll be like a joe rogan episode all right, we're going to Joe Rogan, the third and fourth way. Stay Absolutely. tuned. Strap in, gentle listeners, and you can help us out by checking out Gavin's stuff, of course. Uh, you know, Support everything he's doing. But this channel, <laughs> like, share, comment, subscribe. Let Grandma know what's happening over at Philosophy for the People. And uh, <laughs> we'll catch you guys on the next episode. Adios.